get a small wooden boat and go up the Yazoo River. And they look at different places where they think the Cairo might be. But Ed takes this compass, a magnetic compass, puts it in the bottom of this wooden rowboat or motorboat. And as we're moving up and down the river looking for the Cairo, at this one spot, this magnetic needle just goes haywire, indicating the presence of something massive metallic underneath the surface. Well, they waited for some low water and took some probes out and poked this probe down in the water and clink, 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 clink. Sure enough, there was something there which caused them to further investigate it. And divers would eventually go down, bring up some artifacts from the gunboat, which were clearly Civil War era in vintage. And this would lead to a full-blown salvage operation. Although the salvage operations commenced in 1959, it's not until 1964 that they are finally successful in bringing Cairo from the bottom to the surface. And they bring it to the surface exactly 102 years to the day after she went down, December 12th in 1964, it's brought to the surface. Now the idea initially was to sling cables under the Cairo and just simply pick it up out of the water. Another plan uh, that was hatched uh, was to lift the Cairo, move it downstream or upstream, I forget which, move a barge and sink it into the place the Cairo rested. That's, it. That's the first plan. Sink this barge into position, put the Cairo back on top of it, then pump the water out of the barge and slowly lift the Cairo to surface intact. Unfortunately, as they were pumping the water out of the barge, they did not do so evenly. And as it started coming out of the water, suddenly the barge tipped and the Cairo went back into the water. So the next plan was to put slings under the Cairo, simply pick it up out of the water, and then put it on the barge. But as they did so, the lifting cable sliced through the Cairo, and it had to be brought up in pieces. Now about 80% of the vessel was brought to the surface. It was initially taken to the Vicksburg waterfront, then taken down to the Ingalls Shipbuilding Yard in Pascagoula, Mississippi, where it was hoped that the naval architects and engineers down there could put the vessel back together. It sat there for 13 years on the Gulf Coast, exposed to intense sunlight, hurricanes, and vandals. During that 13 year period, there was a big uh, battle for uh, ownership of the vessel. Uh, it would initially be decommissioned, uh, not even decommissioned, it would be transferred from the Navy to Warren County, Mississippi. But when Warren County realized the price tag involved in restoration, and doing anything else with the vessel, they decided we don't want it and tried to pawn it off to the state of Mississippi, which finally, after several years, accepted the title to it. But then Mississippi also realized, well, this is going to cost a heck of a lot of money that they didn't want to invest. So they turned it back over to the federal government and eventually it was turned over to the National Park Service. But 13 years transpired between all of this, during which time much of gunboat Cairo rotted down at Ingalls and had to be discarded or it was stolen by vandals. By the time the National Park Service acquires title to this vessel in 1977, only 35 percent of the original gunboat is left. That's what we brought to Vicksburg and that's what we have put back in place below you here. To give you an idea of the size and shape of this vessel, we have put in what's called a ghosting effect, a ribbing if you will, and to that is also then attached the armor plating and so on. But we have about 35% of the vessel on display. Initially, the Park Service had wanted to put this in an, in an environmental enclosure. But at that point in time, the price tag was deemed too excessive by members of the Congress, as well as the director of the National Park Service. And so we were told to scale the plans down, scale the plans down, scale the plans down. What we ended up with is an outdoor exhibit with the Cairo underneath a large metal canopy. The canopy, however, failed to provide adequate protection to the vessel from driving winds and rain, intense sunlight, certainly had no effect against the keeping insects out of the boat, feral animals, and so on. And so the Cairo has continued to slowly decay and rot away. When the canopy, the original canopy, which by the way only cost $150,000, uh, finally uh, showed signs of uh, imminent failure. We went back to the Congress to get funding for a replacement canopy. We tried very hard 
to take advantage of that opportunity and convince the members of the Congress that what is needed for long-term preservation of this vessel is an environmental enclosure where you can keep it protected from wind and rain, the humidity and temperature extremes and so on. We had our two U.S. Senators visit here quite frequently and we argued with them boisterously in favor of this environmental enclosure. I well recall Senator Lott looking me in the eye and saying, Terry, I'm just one Senator. I need to convince 50 of my comrades on Capitol Hill and I guarantee you I cannot do it at the price tag that will be required for this building. As a result, we ended up with a $3 million appropriation to replace the canopy. So from $150,000 for the original canopy to $3 million for what you're seeing going up down below you here. This new canopy is only estimated to last 15 to 20, 25 years max. What's its replacement going to cost? With the money spent thus far in this project, we could have easily had the environmental enclosure to begin with and paid for its operation. But be that as it may, and I don't want to sound like sour grapes, I'm very grateful to get this new canopy. It is lower, wider, will provide more adequate protection to the gunboat from the intense sunlight that dries that wood out. It will also provide greater protection against the driving winds and rain that occasionally saturate the vessel. This project is way behind schedule. It was due to be completed in April 2002. We hope to have the museum open maybe this summer, if we're lucky, but uh, hopefully before long, you good folks from Louisville will be able to come back and actually get on board the gunboat and look inside the museum, okay? Let's uh, return to the bus as we still have so much to see. Yes, sir. I'll be able to point that out in the next talk. Yeah. John Thomas down there. I have two more labels, you can... Okay. It won't be long now. Scratching the head, how did that happen, right? Pardon? Yeah, and everybody exactly. in the round table just scratching their head, wondering how that happened. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, I heard the purpose was to honor the soldiers that fought here. Well, how do you do that by putting the Lincoln in Davis? <laughs> Nice. Nice and clean. Folks, we are at the northern anchor of the Union siege lines around the city. Again, off to your right is that horseshoe-shaped bend of the Mississippi River. Just follow the placement of that in that in those industrial buildings to get a pretty good idea of that horseshoe. And beyond the horseshoe is the water of the Yazoo River. We're also overlooking the grounds of Vicksburg National Cemetery. Due to the size of the bus, we're not going to go through the National Cemetery. We'll go by it, however. We talked briefly uh, the other day in Louisiana about the establishment of Vicksburg National Cemetery, how it came about. This is the largest national cemetery in the United States in terms of Civil War burials. Again, there are 17,000 Union soldiers and sailors interred in the National Cemetery here. Folks, as we go around the bend, I noticed that our, our maintenance crew, either our maintenance crew or the wind in recent days, has taken the tarp off of the gunboat Cairo. As we go slowly, and you go slowly past the boat, you'll see the forward casemate with its three big guns pointing out. That's quite an impressive sight. The Cairo, as mentioned, and her sisters had 13 big guns. They would see actions at Fort Henry and Donaldson, uh, Plum Point Bend, the Battle of Memphis, here at Vicksburg, and then elsewhere in 1864 along the Red River. Are those original guns? All the guns are original guns on their original carriages in their original locations, correct. Now you can see the flat bottom of the gunboat Cairo, the hole in the, on our right, in the forward section, that's where the torpedo hit, that doomed gunboat Cairo to the bottom. You also see the octagonal shaped pilot house up top with its smaller openings where the pilot and the boat captain could, uh, could look through during time of battle. 
But again, it's 175 feet long and 52 feet wide. It had a complement of 175 officers and enlisted men. Now, Commander Selfridge, when he assumed command of the Cairo, wanted to provide greater protection to his gunners, so he put railroad iron on both the starboard and port forward quarter. Well, yes, sir, we're all set. But once we open the facility, once again, you'll actually be able to walk on board the gun deck itself and take a look at the engines, uh, the boilers, the steam drums, the cannon, and so on. But again, here is Vicksburg National Cemetery. You know there are two different types of headstones, upright stones and small square blocks. The small blocks are in far greater number. Well, the stone upright stones are those of your identified soldiers, whereas the small square blocks are the graves of the unknown, the unidentified. You recall there was no system of dog tags during the Civil War, no means of identification for these men. Due to the large numbers of Civil War soldiers who would die as unidentified soldiers, and roughly 56% of all burials of Civil War soldiers in our national cemeteries nationwide are unidentified, Congress would finally, uh, I'd say Congress, at least the Army, would implement the uh, uh, institution of dog tags. Here we are going across Mint Spring. You recall the stream where mint grew abundantly and helped make the first mint julep. Well, Mint Spring is a line of demarcation, if you will, between the Union and Confederate forces. We are now in the Confederate line. Now, as it is the responsibility of the different states to erect monuments, the southern states were very reluctant to erect monuments in Vicksburg. As one legislator from Mississippi said, why should we erect a monument in a Yankee park? But eventually, the southern states would come about and erect monuments. But the southern states were very much in a state of economic deprivation following the Civil War and the Reconstruction era that followed. And they would not follow suit with monuments until many years after the first of the northern states, by which time the cost of monumentation had skyrocketed. So although they were very generous in their appropriation, their money did not go nearly as far. And so there is a paucity of monuments on the southern line, and we'll see them shortly. Here on your left front, this is Fort Hill, the northern anchor of the Confederate defense line around the city. For obvious reasons, you can see why this position was never stormed by Union infantry forces. Just uh, two weeks ago, a few days prior to the 10-inch rain, we had a controlled burn on this hillside. That's the only way we maintain this hill. And so we, uh, first of all, spray a chemical, kill the grass and other trees and then we torch it from the bottom. It goes up in a matter of about 15 seconds. It's quite impressive. Ed's at the top. Oh, is he? Yeah, he's up there waving his baton. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I was up the top of Fort Hill pocket? with Ed Bars one day. Tapes? No, and as much as Norman, I do a tour with Ed. I, I'm his map holder. Oh, wait, I might have So one. I'm standing on my tippy toes. At the, I'm only holding on by my toes. I'm doing like a hang 10 almost. I'm standing on my tippy toes at the very edge of Fort Hill while Ed's pacing back and forth in front of me. He has that plastic baton in his hand, and he says, and over here, wham, and he hits the map that I'm holding. Whoa! <laughs> Down the hill I went. <laughs> What did he have? He's a loose kid. Did he? Did he tell you to come back here? <laughs> well, let's go up and uh, we'll listen to what Ed has to say. <laughs> did he feel bad about it is what I want to know. Oh, check us all by you. I've been asked to point out Chickasaw Bayou. Uh, of course, here's the men in the Mississippi River. All that low flat ground off to your left front, you'll see it over top of the Anderson Tully lumber yard. That is all Chickasaw Bio Battlefield. Yes, sir, please. Okay. Training there to see. Uh, there is one highway historical marker at Chickasaw Bio, and that is it. Although the area all the way from the landing site on the Yazoo River up to the main Confederate defense line has remained virtually unchanged since the days of the Civil War. And, and the main reason for that, it floods every year, and sometimes as many as six months out of the year, that whole battlefield is underwater. In the very narrow corridor where all the fighting took place, it has changed dramatically due to commercial, industrial, and residential development along U.S. Highway 61. But we'll get out here and go on top of the hill. We'll listen to what Ed has to say and then what 
Uh, he has already said or leaves out, I'll let you folks know, okay? <laughs> In the hill just to save time as, a, as our time is fast running out. Let's continue talking from here. Now this is how we are oriented. Again, we're at Fort Hill, the northern anchor of the Confederate defense line around the fortress city of Vicksburg. You see the horseshoe shaped bend of the river at this point. Now here's a map showing the water courses then and now. This is the water course as it existed in 1863. We are standing here now at Fort Hill, right at the head of the Soto Bend and opposite the Soto Point. The Mississippi River coming downstream from Memphis would reach the town of DeSoto where it made a wide sweeping turn to the north, then made a horseshoe bend, hit the bluff line, and then followed the bluff line due south past Natchez down to New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico. However, in 1876, in a, high of un in a year of unusually high water, the strong force of the current cut through this naturally weak land here at the base of DeSoto Point and the river changed course. You see the present day course here. And again, we are at Fort Hill at the north end here. With the river changing course in 1876, it brought economic calamity to the area. As a result, the Corps of Engineers began construction of a six mile long canal diverting the waters of the Yazoo River from just beyond those industrial buildings through the former channel of the Mississippi River to give Vicksburg the port once again. So what you are looking at below, first of all, is the project, the port project of Vicksburg. You see it here, the harbor project. And then the Yazoo Canal, this straight stream coming in here. But thanks to this canal, Vicksburg is once again the largest inland port on the state. Now many of you have asked about Chickasaw Bio Battlefield. You see the lumber yard off to your right. You see the open fields beyond leading to the Yazoo River. All of that is Chickasaw Bio Battlefield where General Sherman's Union Expeditionary Force met with disaster December 27th, 28th, and 29th of 1862. You recall that Sherman said we'll lose 5,000 men taking Vicksburg and this is as good a place as any. Well, he lost 1,776 men that day, but was easily and bloodily repulsed. As Grant's army is marching down the west side of the river and being uh, approaching hard times and on the verge of crossing the Mississippi River to ensure the success of his operations, to help ensure, Grant had requested Sherman, whose corps had remained behind, to launch a demonstration once again in that same area to keep Confederate attention focused north of Vicksburg while the landing is actually taking place to the south. Grant, due to Sherman's previous defeat here, realized he was asking the general to do a, a very delicate operation, one that may have severe consequences for Sherman, especially in the media and with the political authorities. And so he asked Sherman, first of all, if he would consent to doing this. Sherman would place the national interest above his own interest and he told the general he'd be more than happy to do so. So Sherman, on December, I'm sorry, on April the 30th, the day that Grant's crossing is taking place, Sherman will land troops up here near Chickasaw Bayou once again, move across that open land in a demonstration against these fortifications to keep Confederate Pemberton and the garrison here in Vicksburg riveted to the north. The, uh, the uh, demonstration will be successful in that regard and Grant will cross unopposed at uh, Bruinsburg. Now, let's go back in time to the start of this operation. You recall in late March of 1863, Grant had tried these various bio operations, all of which had ended in dismal failure. There was tremendous controversy swirling around Grant's name in political and military circles, tremendous clamor. 
in the press to remove Grant as commander of the Western Army, and even members of the cabinet were urging President Lincoln to remove Grant from command. But Grant, I'm sorry, the president answered those critical of Grant by saying, I can't spare this man, he fights. I'll try him a little longer. But cognizant of that criticism and realizing that even the president's patience had limitations, Grant was at a crossroads in his military career, and so he examined what options were left him to capture Vicksburg. We talked about those three options, and Grant would settle on the option to march his army south through Louisiana. But even by marching south through Louisiana, that leaves a major obstacle between he and his opponent, namely the Mississippi River. Now, Union soldiers are capable of many things, but I have yet to find any shred of evidence to suggest that they can walk on water. <laughs> he will need the assistance of the Navy, but there are four miles of gleaming batteries fronting the Vicksburg waterfront. It will be necessary for the, uh, the gunboats and transport vessels to run by those batteries. You recall that in March of 63, Ulysses S. Grant can no longer order Admiral Porter to do anything. He could only request, and it was within the Admiral's rights to turn him down. Now, you can imagine Admiral David Porter when Grant first approached him with the idea of running by the batteries of Vicksburg to the south, something deemed impossible by many. The Admiral was shocked, gasped at the mere suggestion, but he realized Grant was serious, and so he told Grant, Think long and hard about this, General. If that's what you want me to do, I'll make the attempt, but bear in mind that should my fleet get below the batteries of Vicksburg, it will never come back up river until Vicksburg has fallen. You see, going down river with the current, they can make about six knots, but coming up river, the powerful lumbering ironclad such as Cairo and her sisters can only make about two knots. As a result, they would be under fire for a much longer period of time, and it was believed that not even the ironclads could withstand the shelling that would be hurled against them. Consequently, Grant tells, uh, sorry, Porter tells Grant, think long and hard about this. Well, Grant thinks about it and says, that's what I need you to do. So Porter acquiesced. The night selected for the passage of the batteries is April the 16th of 1863. It is a dark, moonless night. In preparation for this attempted passage of the Vicksburg batteries, all the vessels are painted black, their running lights are extinguished, their engines will be muffled by bales of hay and bales of cotton stacked around the engines and outside on the gun deck itself. Porter's intentions are to cast anchor, raise anchor, and drift with the current silently as long as possible hug the Louisiana shore, the opposite shore, where it was hoped that that dense stand of trees across the way would help conceal these vessels from the roving eyes of Confederate gunners here on the bluff line at Vicksburg. Unbeknownst to Admiral Porter, however, the Confederates made it a, a habit of each and every night stationing scouts in small skiffs out here at the head of DeSoto Point the guard against and uncover any attempt by the Union Navy to run by these batteries to the south. And on the night of April the 16th, around 11 o'clock at night, as the vessels are drifting out into the channel and taking up their movement, these scouts out in the skiffs see these huge dark shapes sweeping down river toward them and they recognize them to be Union gunboats and transport vessels. Immediately, these scouts row to either side of the Mississippi River where already barrels of tar, bales of cotton soaked in turpentine have been placed and are set afire. Confederates on the other side of the river will also set fire to the small hamlet of DeSoto, torching all the buildings, not only to illuminate the river, but to silhouette the Union fleet as it attempts to run by the batteries. Admiral Porter is in the first vessel in line, and as he rounds DeSoto Point directly below us here, he passes by the guns of the powerful water battery. All is deathly quiet. Porter's hopes begin to rise that perhaps he'll be successful in running by these batteries undetected. But suddenly, the night sky is ablaze from these barrels of tar and bales of cotton. Suddenly, the heavy boom of artillery is heard as the Confederate batteries awaken and open fire upon the fleet. Immediately, Porter sends up the signal to pick up steam and run by these batteries just as quickly as the boats can go. 
But as the vessels continue downstream, more and more of the Confederate batteries come into play. They will fire solid shot and shell down on the gunboats. Hugging the Louisiana shore, they are being hit by solid shot and shell. But Porter pays very close attention to where these shot and shell are landing. And he notices they're hitting his smokestacks, his pilot houses and wheel houses. Some are hitting the hurricane deck. A few are getting down to the gun decks, but almost none are getting any lower to where the vital parts of your boats are situated, your engines, your steam drums, your boilers, and so on. And Porter realizes one of two things is happening here. Either these Confederates are very poor gunners, or there is a fatal flaw in the placement of their batteries that prevents them from depressing their guns sufficiently to draw an effective fire against the gunboats in the river. Now obviously, when they mounted these guns, they did indeed field test them to see if they could hit the far side of the river, which is no problem. It's well within their range. But I have yet to unearth any evidence to suggest that they were ever tested to see if they could hit the near side of the river, believing if they could hit the far side, surely they could hit the near side. But here on the night of April the 16th, the Confederates are awakened to the fact that there is a fatal flaw in the placement of their batteries. Many of their guns are too high up this bluff line or behind too thick a parapet and thus cannot depress their tube sufficiently to draw an effective fire against the near side of the river. Porter quickly seizes on this and orders his vessels as they round DeSoto Point to move across the current and hug the Mississippi shore, get as close to these guns as possible. Now at first the gun captains, I'm sorry, the, the boat captains and the pilots behind Porter thought the Admiral had gone crazy, but sure enough, here's the flag boat moving across the current, and they followed suit. So close did they come to the Mississippi shore that Union sailors reported hearing the commands being given by Confederate gun captains. They also reported hearing bricks tumbling in the city streets, the effect of their own shell fire. But they realized that the shot and shell were now flying harmlessly overhead. After four hours of bombardment, only one vessel, an unmanned transport boat known as the Henry Clay, was sunk. Although every vessel was hit, some repeatedly, only one vessel was lost. And after four hours, the last boat in line has made it past the southernmost battery. The impossible had been achieved. Grant now had the wherewithal to cross the mighty river. And so again, you cannot overemphasize the role of the Union Navy. Without the Navy getting below Vicksburg, Grant's operations that we've been talking about these past few days could never have come about. Any questions about the Navy's role? Was, right. it, was, there, was there any any naval vessels south in Natchez or New Orleans that could have come up and done the same thing? Or were there any naval vessels south of Vicksburg that could have come up and done the same thing? There are quite a number of Union naval vessels in the river below Port Hudson, Louisiana, in between Port Hudson and Baton Rouge, and then, of course, a number in New Orleans, and then the, the Gulf blockading squadron out in the Gulf. What prevents them from coming upriver are the guns of Port Hudson, Louisiana, which is the other Confederate bastion roughly 200 river miles south of here. Vicksburg is the top part of the Walnut. Port Hudson is the south part of the Walnut. Now, Farragut. David Farragut, in command of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, would attempt to run by the batteries of Port Hudson with a number of his ocean-going vessels coming upriver. The batteries there are very strong, similarly situated to Vicksburg, high on bluffs, commanding a large horse, almost horseshoe-shaped bend of the river. Only two vessels will make it by the batteries. So dense is the smoke on the river that the third vessel in line, the USS Mississippi, is hit repeatedly, is set on fire, and starts drifting uh, helplessly down river. Seeing the Mississippi afire, seeing the river blanketed in smoke, losing their sense of direction, none of the other vessels would attempt to go by the battery. So only two make it. Uh, Farragut will come up river. He will confer with his uh, foster brother, David Porter, for a while, and then go back down to help in the reduction of Port Hudson. So in answer to your question, for all intents and purposes, no. No vessels could be coming up from downstream. Yes, ma'am. Was there any attempt to place uh, batteries or any defenses on DeSoto Point, or was that just not suitable? Was there any attempt to place defenses on DeSoto Point? Not by the Confederacy. 
simply due to the fact you would have a river in front of you and a river behind you that is controlled by the Union Navy. But the United States forces, on the other hand, after moving into this area, would establish batteries on the Soto Point. Okay. Okay, folks, let's reboard the bus. I hope to make uh, uh, two more stops before the day is over. Just like neighbors. I'm going to talk about that. I can't get the Never mind. Okay. Okay. We'll stop the railroad to Dow and then uh, go over to the Kentucky Mine and that'll be about it. Does that suit you okay? Give me help it back. Give me help it for 15, 4, 30. Uh, that's right. Uh, and yeah, Tracy and I are both going to make that graduation party. Uh, they think we're crazy because we know each other. It's just perfect. <laughs> Folks, we are now on the Confederate defense line. As we drive along the Confederate Avenue here, remember that at all times the Union forces are off to your left at varying distances from several hundred yards to just a few feet. You note this is a commanding rise, and as we drive along, occasionally you'll get glimpses of the opposing, for, uh, the opposing line, such as here. It gives you an idea that Major Sam Lockett really made a wonderful choice for his defensive perimeter. You also note the paucity of Confederate artillery, and much of the Confederate artillery here is light field pieces, six pounders, 12 pounders, which are great at close range, but aren't very effective at long range. You also note the paucity of monuments. Again, it's a state responsibility to erect monuments on the battlefield here at Vicksburg, as at all other national military parks and national battlefields. But I think you'll find that Major Sam Lockett did his job, and it did his job well. And it's thanks to the construction of these field fortifications, more than anything else, I would suggest, that enabled the Confederate garrison of Vicksburg to hold out for 47 days through the siege operations here at Vicksburg. Coming up on your left is uh, one of our newer monuments dedicated back in, uh, I think it was 96, the Tennessee Monument. Uh, although erected by the state of Tennessee. It's actually erected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy Tennessee Division, acting as the state's representative. They did this without any state funding whatsoever, just by uh, cookie sales, car washes, and so on. So when you consider that, it's a fairly nice monument. Why is it that there's so many, everything to the union is, you know, outdoes really? anything. For the well, the question is, why does everything for the Union uh, kind of outdo things for the Confederacy in terms of their elaborate, uh, ornate, uh, Money. grandiose appearance? Well, bear in mind, this was a tremendous Union victory, the oh. most decisive of the war. And the soldiers of the North that fought here at Vicksburg really wanted people, not only of that generation, but future generations, to know of the significant role they played in American history. Uh, also, these states were fairly wealthy states, especially in the post-war era, and they appropriated hefty sums of money. Plus, they do it early on, when the uh, cost of monuments is far less. As mentioned, the Illinois Monument, $200,000. The Kentucky Monument that you'll see shortly, erected here and dedicated uh, just last year, $250,000 was appropriated by the state of Kentucky. And I think when you see the Kentucky Monument, compared that to the Illinois Monument, it gives you some idea of how much monuments cost. In Pennsylvania, what was 180? Yeah. Uh, the Pennsylvania Monument, Gettysburg, correct. About 180. Correct. In fact, when I worked at Gettysburg uh, years back, it cost us more money just to clean the Pennsylvania Monument than it did to build it. Well, what, and the same here in Vicksburg, when we cleaned the Illinois Monument uh, back in the 1980s, it cost us more money to clean the monument than it did to build it back in 1906. We're still not finished. I it. find that absolutely ludicrous. But yeah. yes, ma'am. You don't have to know just off time here what what with inflation was. Say two hundred thousand dollars in eighteen eighty would be. Off the top of my head, would I know what two hundred thousand dollars would be today? Yeah. No, I don't. But let me give you this as a as a possible answer to your question. We we are currently undergoing a new program in the National Park Service where we put a a value to absolutely everything. We've been asked to put values on these monuments. Now, how do you put a, mo a value on some of these things? Certainly, you can put a value on stone and bronze and mortar, but you can't put a, a value to the symbolism and the 
meaning of these monuments, but we have estimated that if in the year 2003 you wanted to build the Illinois Monument, it would cost about $55 million, and that's only if you can find the artisans who could do that type of work. So much of this is a lost art. You know, we've commented uh, over the course of the day about the Kentucky Monument, the sculptures on the Kentucky Monument, or the Long Street statue at Gettysburg. These are some of the finest sculptors in America today, but they can't hold a candle for the sculptors that were here in America in the late 19th, early 20th century. It's an art that we are losing. It's a skill that just doesn't exist anymore. And the same with these stone craftsmen. Uh, so much of the Illinois Monument was, uh, it may interest you to learn, the Illinois Monument was actually built by uh, Italian stone cutters that were brought in from Italy. Many of them were women. We have uh, photographs of women with their full skirts hammering and chiseling on the different stones and sliding them into place. Uh, you just can't find that type of craftsmanship in America today. Ed gave a speech once about the art, visiting the parks and thinking of the art. Uh, his whole talk was on the artwork. Yes, sir. Uh, are we going to pass the Lloyd Tillman Monument? We sure will. We'll pass the, the monument to General Tillman. I'll point that out to you. You mentioned the horses got preserved. Oh, there sure are, without question. There's a, there are a large number of people who are very much opposed to us removing this force, very much opposed to it. And it's a, a force that is very powerful. It's a force we'll have to, to deal with. And it's a force that may actually beat us out. They may, they may end up getting their way because this will clearly go to the federal courts, without question. It will go to the courts. Now, in the case of Gettysburg National Military Park, it did, in fact, go to the courts. It, and they, the courts ruled that... Look at the enabling legislation of the park. The park was established for a particular reason, and that reason is outlined in the enabling legislation, and the park commissioners were charged at that point in time with restoring the field to its wartime appearance. Judge ruled case closed. We're hoping the same will happen here, but it will be challenged and it will go to court. What kind of organization would want to stop it? Uh, the Sierra Club comes to mind real quick. Yeah. Here on your left, folks, uh, uh, there's Ed, Ed's group up at the uh, Stockhaver Dam. Uh, here on your left is the Missouri Monument and the relief portrait of General Martin Green, one of the five Confederate generals who died during the uh, Vicksburg campaign. This particular monument is dedicated to the soldiers of both sides, as Missouri was a state of divided sympathy. You note the rightmost panel shows Confederate soldiers from Missouri defending this location from federal soldiers from Missouri attacking this very position. And the center is the spirit of the Republic guiding the ship of state. This is the work of uh, sculptor, uh, uh, I'll think of it here in just a second. Just let my mind, very, very beautiful. Uh, El, Elway, not Elway, uh, I'll think of it here. But this particular monument is dedicated to the soldiers of both sides. It stands at Green's Redan. Now there was a fort here. In some cases it's referred to as Green's Redan, others Green's Redoubt. Now on June the 25th, at the day of the mine explosion, firing erupted all along the lines here. General Green in this fort is wounded. He's taken back to the hospitals in town where the surgeons examining him realize it's not a life-threatening wound, but they recommend he stay in the hospital for a couple days, rest and recover. But Green is a fiery, aggressive soldier, wants no part of that. He knows, but you see the blue tablets right behind here, that the Union troops were getting awful close to this fort in their approach operations. He wanted to keep tabs on it and monitor the situation. So he left the hospitals, rode out here to the fort, dismounted from his horse, and as he was walking into the fort and up to one of the embrasures where you see that bronze tablet on the red pedestal, one of his soldiers stopped him and said, General, don't go any closer today. The Union sharpshooters are very active and they are very accurate. Green shrugged off the admonition saying, nonsense, the bullet meant for me has yet to be molded. And he stuck his head out the embrasure when there was a crack of a musket and Martin Green fell dead. So if there's a lesson to be learned, <laughs> never make an utter, uh, fully statement in the presence of the enemy. It might be your last. It's kind of like uh, John Sedgwick in Spotsylvania talking about the sharpshooters couldn't hit an elephant at this range. That's Frank Elwell. That's who did that, Frank Elwell. 
Mm. <coughs> on your right is the Arkansas Monument. Again, one of our newer monuments, so to speak, dedicated in the 1950s. On the rightmost panel is the CSS Arkansas that saw action here in the summer of 1862, much to the embarrassment of uh, Admiral David Farragut. But the Arkansas Monument shows the nation divided by the sword, yet reunited on the altar of faith. Very similar in design to the Gettysburg Monument, which was dedicated around the same time. Okay. During the course of the siege, as it lasted so long, Union, our, uh, Union soldiers gave the Confederate cannon nicknames. The gun that was in this position here was known as Crazy Jane. But uh, the most famous Confederate cannon, without question, was the famous Whistling Dick. Now, uh, Dick was an 18-pounder rifled gun. Uh, it had exploded early in the siege, and so they had to saw off part of its muzzle. And due to its shortened barrel, they used it more or less as a mortar for much of the siege. But it made a strange whistling sound. And you could hear it everywhere. You always knew when Dick was firing because of this whistling sound. But it became so popular that in almost every single Union soldier's letter home, they tell their parents, I came under fire of the whistling dick today. It didn't matter what part of the siege lines they were on. They came under the fire of whistling dick. And whatever Confederate soldiers' letters you read, they all fired the whistling dick that sank the Cincinnati. Every one of them fired, you know. Oh, I just happened to be walking along uh, somewhere five miles from where my regiment was, and they asked me if I wanted to take a shot at a gunboat. You know, it's absolutely amazing uh, how many letters say they fired the whistling dick that sank the Cincinnati. Well, of course, the dick didn't sink Cincinnati. But it was so famous that at the end of the siege, the Union soldiers really wanted to take this field piece captured, uh, captive and they found a gun that they thought was Dick, and so they sent it up to West Point and put it on Trophy Row. And it sat on Trophy Row for almost a hundred years when finally somebody realized, wait a second, this is a, um, uh, Dick was an 18-pounder. This thing is, is not an 18-pounder. Uh, and so they ended up, uh, it was the Widow Blakely. And so they ended up uh, realizing, uh, much to their embarrassment, it was not the Whistling Dick, so they took it down off of display and they sent it back here to Vicksburg, and that's where we made our very first stop two days ago at the Widow Blakely. We're crossing over Glass Bayou. We're now going to be ascending the rise at the top of which runs the, uh, the Jackson Road, where the third Louisiana Redan is situated, where the mine explosions took place, where Abraham the slave was blown to freedom. It's also up here where Generals Grant and General Pemberton We'll meet on the afternoon of July 3rd to discuss the surrender of the city of Vicksburg. And I'll point that site out to you. Also at the top of this rise will be the Great Redoubt, the largest and most formidable fort in the Confederate defense line. And it is at this fort where the Louisiana Monument now stands, or I should say, rest in pieces on the ground. Uh, we are going to start restoration on this monument here before too many more weeks pass. And hopefully by year's end or early 2004, we'll have that monument restored to its original splendor. That monument cost $30,000, folks, in 1920. It's going to cost you, the American taxpayer, or I should say we, the American taxpayers, about $1.2 million to put it back together. It gives you an idea of the high cost of maintenance in our national military parks. Just one monument. Our, our budget can't yeah. possibly support that, so it takes line item appropriations. George, if you want to slow down, just a moment. Folks, look off. To, if you look off to your left, you'll see that uh, oak tree uh, and an upright cannon to the side of it. That is the spot where Pemberton and Grant met to discuss the surrender of the city on July the 3rd. They met between the lines in the shade of a stunted oak. And according to Grant and his memoirs, that tree was immediately uprooted and dismantled by his soldiers and that more cords of wood have come from it than the true cross. <laughs> See it right there? Here on your right is the Great Redoubt, but you note this ravine to your left. This is the ravine up so which charged the men of the 7th Missouri U.S. Infantry. All the way up this ravine, they are surging in defilade, meaning they can't be hit. And they will jump into the ditch and plant their colors where you see the blue tablet to your right. That particular regiment from St. Louis, Missouri, were Irishmen through and through. From the, uh, They were river rats from the docks in St. Louis. And so they advanced up that hill under the green flag of Ireland with the gold harp on it emblazoned Aaron Go Bra 
Well, defending this fort were Louisianians from New Orleans, Irishmen to the core, river rats who worked the docks in New Orleans. And they defended this fort under a green flag with a gold harp, a blazing Aaron go bra. Commanding Company A of the 21st Louisiana Infantry in this fort was no less an individual than Captain David Todd. Now, you may, may not be familiar with the good captain, but you certainly know his brother-in-law very well, Abraham Lincoln. On your right is General Tillman's monument. This is the monument erected by Frederick and Sedell Tillman, sons of the general, and dedicated in, uh, I think, 1927. It depicts General Tillman at the moment of his death and the battle at Champion Hill. Now, they put this monument here and a much smaller one on the site of his actual death, as we saw yesterday. The reason they did that is this was a national park and would be protected. We get more visitors. They put the bigger monument here. But this monument, uh, dedicated in 1927, you see how large it is. It's considered one of the finest equestrian statues in the United States. It was hit by a tornado-like wind in 1941 and actually moved 18 feet and then toppled over, and the horse's front legs were broken off. If you take a close look at it, you see where they were welded back on close to the torso. Needless to say, his sword blade has been stolen about 30 times over the years. One of these days, uh, we'll get a, a better replacement. That's an iron replacement, and iron, of course, reacts very badly with bronze. So we need to get rid of that and put in either a stainless steel or, or possibly even a plastic one. We haven't been known to do that. Uh, and that's something that's being done nationwide on monuments where, where vandalism is frequent, like bayonet tips, sword tips, pistol barrels, things of that nature, that are broken off repeatedly because each time you break metal off of metal, it causes more damage to the original fabric. And so in many of our parts, we're starting to put up plastic sword blades on these monuments as replacements uh, and patinate them the same color as bronze. So from a distance or even up close, they look like metal. But if they're broken off, the vandals only get away with a piece of plastic that's easily replaced. Makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. As we continue along the uh, tour road, we're near the center of the Confederate defense line. This particular location is manned by Confederate troops led by General John Forney. We have not talked about General Forney yet. Uh, his division does not see any action in this campaign until the siege itself. Uh, we know very little about the general you, whom you see standing on your right here. He's rather an enigma, and I often wonder, although he's a West Point grad, what really qualified this man for such, uh, here he comes right in front of us, I'm sorry, uh, what qualified this man for such high command, and, and I'm at a loss to explain it. I don't know much about John Forney. There's never been a biography on the man other than a, uh, a small book that's written by uh, one of his family members, and uh, you think that he had ascended at the right hand of God, but that's John Forney. We talked a lot uh, in the past couple days about a man named Sam Lockett. You recall Sam Lockett is the chief engineer of the Confederate Army of Vicksburg, who does double duty as the chief engineer of the Department of Mississippi and East Louisiana. After the Civil War, he would actually work for the Khedive of Egypt, as did so many former Confederate officers, such as uh, William W. Loring, such as uh, 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 Henry Hopkins, Sibley, you know, those really high-quality guys. Here is Lockett on your right. He is the man who designed and built the Vicksburg fortifications. Also on your right, you'll see the Mississippi Monument, one of the earlier southern monuments erected on this battlefield, dedicated in 1909. Now, when the measure was introduced in the State House for approval of a state monument at Vicksburg, it passed by just one vote. It passed by just one vote. Now, it was thanks largely to the charisma of former Confederate Lieutenant General Stephen D. Lee. One legislator went on record saying it would be nothing but a vain, glorious tinkling of brass that only the curly-headed dude would see while picnicking with his sweetheart. I guess being a curly-headed dude back then was uh, something uh, bad. But it, but that, it passed by one vote. And then when the appropriation measure came before the uh, House, it also passed by only one vote. But that monument cost uh, oh, somewhere around $40,000, uh, dedicated in 1909. We recently restored it at the tune of almost $1.5 million.
So we had to take off all the bronze that you see there, which uh, depicts battle scenes. The, the woman up there is Cleo, the muse of history, recording the names of her valorous sons from Mississippi who served in Vicksburg's defense. But all that bronze was taken off, shipped to Boston, Massachusetts, where it uh, remained for two years undergoing restoration and was brought back just a year before last and put back on the monument. A magnificent restoration job. Coming up on your right is the standing statue to the Army Commander General John Pemberton. You recall that under the Parks Administration, uh, the monumentation policy, the park wanted an equestrian statue to Pemberton. But it is a state responsibility to erect monuments. Illinois erected Grant's monument. Pemberton was a northerner by birth. Certainly the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania wasn't going to erect <laughs> money to uh, put a monument up to John Pemberton here in Vicksburg. So the park commissioners asked the state of Mississippi to do so, and they turned them down flat. As a result, this is one of only three monuments in the park erected at federal expense. But let there be no doubt in your mind, regardless of what you think of John Pemberton, I think it can be said in all honesty that he did his best. His best just was not good enough. I think Pemberton is a classic case, and we see it so often during the course of the Civil War, where individuals are promoted way beyond their capacities yeah. to command. But it was simply due to the exigencies of the situation at the time. We see it in Ambrose Burnside, for example. He's a classic case on the Union side. But John Pemberton, sadly enough, uh, is elevated beyond his capacities to command. Uh, in fact, Dr. Michael Ballard, who wrote the biography on John Pemberton initially wanted to entitle his book The Saddest Fate of All because that's what Pemberton said of his life in summation. It was the saddest fate of all. I think A.P. Hill was another one. Yes. He, he was a great Yeah, A.P. Hill's another. John Bell Hood's another classic example of being elevated beyond his capacity as command. A heck of a division commander. You're not going to find a better division commander in the Army, North or South, than John Bell Hood, Ambrose Powell Hill, or Pat Claiborne. But in the case of Hill and Hood, they're both elevated beyond those capacities and fail miserably in that new, higher role. Around the next bend, we'll see the statue to Jefferson Davis. This is a statue dedicated back in the 1920s. It is the work of famed sculptor Henry Hudson Kitson. Davis Although born in the Commonwealth of Kentucky in Fairview, grew up in Mississippi in Woodville. But as an adult, he spent most of his adult life here in Warren County, Mississippi, on his plantation, Briarfield. And he was at his plantation at Briarfield in 1861 when he was notified he had been elected president of the Confederacy. Although he returned to Mississippi after the Civil War, his plantation uh, was in shambles. Uh, as a result, he would uh, spend much of his remaining life down on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi in Biloxi at a place called uh, Beauvoir. There, uh, let's see, actually he dies in New Orleans in uh, the 1880s, was initially interred in New Orleans, but then was uh, disinterred and taken to Richmond and buried in Hollywood Cemetery in the Confederate capital. Okay. Uh, his uh, funeral was uh, one of the largest ever. Oh, yes, a big one. The Davis statue used to sit over here because at that big parking lot used to be our old visitor center. But when the old visitor center was removed, uh, that, that big parking lot just didn't make any sense. So the park superintendent at that point in time, who was a native Kentuckian, decided to move the uh, statue to Jefferson Davis over there. Being a native Kentuckian, he took advantage of that opportunity as well. And as they were lowering the Davis bronze statue onto the stone pedestal, he stuck a Lincoln penny under Davis's foot. <laughs> so forever and always, Jefferson Davis has triumphed over Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> River Birch. <laughs> the cemetery on your right is a private inn holding within the boundaries of the park. This is a Jewish cemetery. You recall we saw one at Port Gibson. There's another one at Grand Gulf. There's one in Natchez. These river towns uh, were heavily populated by Jews in the 19th century. They are almost completely extinct today in these same towns. But this Jewish cemetery was established shortly after the siege in 1866, but 30 years prior to the establishment of the National Park. And so it remains today as a private inholding within the boundaries of the park. 
We are now going underneath Clay Street. Uh, this uh, road we're going on is not historic by any stretch of the imagination. It was constructed by the National Park Service in the 1960s simply to afford our visitors a safe crossing of Clay Street. Rather than have an at-grade crossing on Confederate Avenue and an at-grade crossing on Union Avenue, uh, they put in this underpass. So we are now once again in the Union lines, and we are in Union lines manned by the 13th Army Corps under the command of Major General John McClernand. We will follow the route of McClernand's advance on May the 22nd as his troops that formed in line of battle here on this ridge line astride the Southern Railroad of Mississippi, which we're now crossing, will go down the ravines and up the opposite slope, as did his men, to Railroad Redoubt, where the penetration was made. We'll pause briefly at Railroad Redoubt. We'll get out there. I'll talk about the assault on May the 22nd. And that'll give us just about enough time to make one more short stop at the Kentucky Monument so you can all get pictures of it. And if you like, we can take a group picture there as right, well. Right. And then we'll conclude our tour here today. We do have the paperwork in the uh, mill to clear this land to your right between us and the railroad and all the way from Union Avenue up to Railroad Redoubt to expose the line of advance of Union forces in the attack against Railroad Redoubt. We hope to get permission to do that and start clearing later this year. But we're going to stop at Railroad Redoubt. This is where the Texas Monument now stands today. You'll see the newly restored Texas Monument with its gilded letters. It's a magnificent. Yeah. How could a George will pull in here on the right? Oh, I love this one. This is great. Railroad Redoubt. On the uh, map here, again, this is how you are oriented. We have come all the way from Fort Hill to the Stockade Redan, passed by where the mine explosion took place, Great right Redoubt where the Louisiana Monument is. We then saw the Davis statue here by the Second Texas Lunette and the Hebrew Cemetery. We crossed underneath Clay Street, overtop the railroad, and we are now here at Railroad Redoubt. Railroad Redoubt. It's a uh, rectangular safe fortification, very loosely uh, rectangular fortification, guarding the railroad access, which is directly behind us here, into the fortress city of Vicksburg. And here you see Railroad Redoubt here, Second Texas Lunette on the Baldwin Ferry Road near our present day visitor center. So this is the alignment of the Confederate defense line. You can see it continuing off to the south toward Fort Garrett. This entire stretch of the line between Railroad Redoubt and Fort Garrett will be manned by the Alabama Brigade led by Confederate Brigadier General Stephen D. Lee. Now you recall after the debacle at Champion Hill and Big Black River Bridges, Pemberton's army streams into the fortress city of Vicksburg. He has two fresh divisions in the city, those commanded by Martin Luther Smith and that commanded by General John Forney. He will take Martin Luther Smith's division, place it in line here from Fort Hill toward Stockade Redan. Forney's division will occupy the center from roughly Stockade Redan down to Second Texas Lunette. He only has two other divisions. Out of the three he took with him, the Champion Hill, Loring has been cut off. That leaves him just Bowen and Carter Stevenson to man this long stretch of the defense perimeter. Of those two divisions, Carter Stevenson's is the much larger, but it is also poorly led, poorly disciplined, and very weak in terms of its fighting ability. But Bowen's division has been badly mauled. It has fought hard at Grand Gulf. It has fought hard at Port Gibson. It has fought hard at Champion Hill. It has been overrun at Big Black River Bridge, suffering hundreds of casualties, mainly in captured in that latter battle. Although they are still combat ready, they are very small in size. Pemberton decides to take John Bowen's division and put it as a strategic reserve. <coughs> Since it maintains its fighting edge still, use it as a strategic reserve 
that can be rushed to any point along the line that need be. As a result, he will take Carter Stevenson's division, the most unreliable division in the Army, and place it here on this long south end of the line. Of Stevenson's four brigades, the one that is his best and the most combat ready is that brigade of Alabamians that had fought at Port Gibson, that had fought at Champion Hill, now led by Stephen D. Lee. And so he places Lee's brigade in line between Fort Garrett and Railroad Redoubt, and they will be responsible for this defense in this area. On May the 19th, this stretch of the line is not tested, simply due to the fact John McClernand's 13th Corps has crossed the Big Black River on the 18th. It's not quite in position by the 19th, and so really does not take part in that assault. But three days later, on May 22nd, the 13th Corps is well in hand, and the 13th Corps will launch a massive assault against 2nd Texas Lunette, against Railroad Redoubt, and against Fort Garrett to the south. In preparation for the attack against Railroad Redoubt, Union guns will move into position, and for four hours, they will bombard the Confederate works with solid shot and shell. They will aim particularly against the point of the fort out there where you see the cannon and the red and blue tablets together. They will actually hammer a breach in this fortification. Thus, at 10 o'clock in the morning, when the guns fall silent and the infantry surges forward, many of these Union forces will push straight toward that breach in the Confederate line. Included among these units are the 22nd Iowa Infantry and the 77th Illinois. Now, I noticed many of you purchased the book that I did, The Diary of the Soldiers, that I edited of the 77th. 